Because what we're going to be looking at this evening is how we ought to serve. How we ought to serve. As I consider Community Baptist Church and as I consider uh, the, the week that at least the Guatemala team is going to be having next week and as we consider looking back even at last year's trip, it's an encouragement to my heart so many times to see the, the folks of Community Baptist Church in so many different ways serving the Lord. And so in some ways I believe that this, this evening will be an encouragement. Uh, I hope that it is challenging to our hearts as we have uh, maybe some things that we know but just need reminded of brought to bear in our lives. But here we are, Romans chapter 15. Now, last week we looked at Romans chapter 12 in the first several verses, what we need to serve, how the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 in particular, uh, encourages us and commands us that we have a right mindset, that we evaluate things rightly, that we not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, but that we think with right thinking, that we think with sober judgment, healthy thinking. And that will be a right thinking of ourselves, a right thinking of others, a right thinking of the work that we're called to do. With that in place, Paul, having laid that doctrinal foundation for the first 11 chapters of Romans, has, for the last three chapters, given intensely practical instructions of how a believer with a right mind, like we saw last week, is to serve. Beginning there in chapter 12 with the command to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, which necessitates having that right estimation of ourselves, others, and our service, Paul goes to rattle off all these commands through chapter 12 of how we serve the body. Then chapter 13, Paul instructs believers how we're to interact with society at large, with the government, our neighbors, all for the sake of the gospel. Then in chapter 14, which has huge bearings on our text tonight, Paul's going to instruct on how to interact with brothers and sisters in Christ who are weak in the faith. In fact, That's how he opens up chapter 14, verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith. And having given those instructions, Paul is going to conclude this epistle with a final few commands about service. So we come to our text for this evening, Romans 15. We're going to look just at the first six verses, Lord willing. Now, I believe that our text is going to give us at least three very important guidelines for how believers ought to serve in the body. What I want us to look at this evening is that we ought to serve with humility, united, for the glory of God. And there's a tendency, as I already mentioned, for us to say, well, we know this. This is all stuff that we have, that we, we know. We know that our service ought to be humble, that our service ought to be united, ought to be to the glory of God. But Paul's going to put an incredible light on this. He's going to take the example of Christ in particular to demonstrate why our service ought to be humble united and glorifying to God. So let's begin here, verse 1, chapter 15, as we consider how we ought to serve first in humility. Look with me at verse 1. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses, excuse me, the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Now, Paul begins with this reflection back into chapter 14, namely that those who are weak in faith aren't to be trampled by those who are strong. He continues this train of thought in verse 1 with the instruction that we, including himself in that statement, we who are strong, ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Now, a few things we need to understand as we, as we move forward with this in mind, because Paul is beginning with this word now, he's, he's saying, having gone through chapter 14, So we've got to establish, what is Paul talking about in chapter 14? Now most commonly, and and truthfully, before really digging into this study, I assume that this was essentially the same as some of the instructions that Paul gives the church at Corinth about not uh, not causing brothers to stumble over uh, meat offered to idols. The trouble is he never mentions idols in chapter 14. He never talks about meat offered to idols. Now, he does mention in chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, about not eating or drinking certain things. He also deals with, in verse 6 of chapter 14, those who observe different days as being particularly significant. In light of that, some people have assumed that Paul is dealing with legalism, just the same, same way that he does in the book of Galatians. That, you know, some people, they've, they've got their hang-ups from their background in Judaism, and they still want to practice these things. The trouble with that viewpoint is that Paul doesn't, instruct the Galatians to just continue on and not cause others to stumble. 
going a little bit deeper, some commentators have as many as five different scenarios that are possible in chapter 14 that Paul's dealing with, including the ones that I've mentioned, all the way to talking about those who, are weak com- who have weak consciences, consciences held over from their uh, pagan, idolatrous days. Now, this is definitely, chapter 14, this idea of the weak and faith is most definitely not the same situation as Galatians. There, Paul tells the Galatians that if they keep trying to hold on to their Jewish traditions as a means of securing or gathering up righteousness, then Christ is of no profit to them. So this isn't just, well, these people really, really like their Jewish traditions and they're clinging to those for some sake of righteousness, and so it's okay, don't cause them to stumble. That's not what is happening. And the lack of specific reference to meat offered to idols leads us to think this isn't exactly the same as what's happening in Corinth. Instead, I think the most likely situation is that these are true Jewish believers who, with an untrained conscience, Jewish believers, I believe, because of what he says about some things you're not to eat, some days that they're holding in uh, special observance, they're struggling with the freedom that their Gentile brothers have, eating things that were formerly forbidden. They're struggling with not forsaking specific traditional days of observance. They're not doing this because they hope to gain some righteousness from it, but they're doing this because their faith is weak and immature. It's unhealthy. One commentator puts it really succinctly when he gives this definition. They have true faith. They have Christ. But because of traditional teaching or perhaps through Satan's accusation on account of former sins or through not grasping the fact of their death with Christ and their eternal union with him, or possibly because of habits of introspection or self-accusation, or even through unsubdued sins, for some reason or all of these reasons, they're weak. Now, Paul, on the other hand, identifies himself with the strong. He clearly believes, as verse 20 of chapter 14 tells us, that the weak in faith are wrong, but that we ought to, in deference to them, not tear down the work of God over food and drink. So in introducing chapter 15, he says, we ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. And let's be real honest, that that command, that exhortation, that we ought to slow down for the slower runners, that we ought to bear, carry the weaknesses of those that have no strength, this goes against the grain. We live in a world and even in a church culture that's fixated on itself. Everything is made to order. So often we run into situations where you don't like the music in this service, don't worry, we have another one that you'll like more. You don't like this style of preaching? Well, we've got podcasts, the church across town, sermons on the radio or a devotional that will meet you halfway and you never get challenged and you never have to change. You can have church made to order for you, whatever your heart desires. I remember even a few years back looking at a newspaper and finding an ad for a church that was advertising its express service, 45 minutes or less, guaranteed. You don't have to worry about it. You worry about you. Now the wording here in verse 1 could could maybe cause us to find a loophole because our hearts are good at that when it says that we ought to bear the weaknesses of the weak. Now this isn't ought in the sense of I ought to eat a salad instead of this double cheeseburger with bacon. This isn't ought in the sense of I had to give them a call sometime. This is much stronger. This word carries the idea of obligation and debt. In fact, later in this same chapter, chapter 15, verse 27, it's translated as indebted. Paul uses the word again in Ephesians 5, 28, in case we think that there's any kind of loophole here, that, well, maybe it's just something that's optional when he commands that husbands ought to love their wives. Initially, this word had the idea of a a legal or economic usage, that you were indebted or that you were obligated to fulfill these requirements. Later on, it took on a moral obligation, a sense of duty. Most commonly, the New Testament carries this idea of debt. It carries this idea of it's something that we are obligated to do. So when Paul says we ought to bear or carry the weaknesses of those without strength, he's making a bigger point than it would be nice if, or, you know, we really should. He's saying we have a moral obligation 
obligation to do this. And keep in mind, Romans is an argument. Romans is a running argument of Paul saying, therefore, based on these things. And he's built an entire doctrinal foundation of the gospel and what Christ has accomplished on our behalf and empowered us through regenerating us. He's given us the power to accomplish. So when then he gives us commands towards the close of this book, he's saying we ought to do this. We have an obligation due to the gospel that we've received. And how unusual this is in our world that we would bear the burdens of another. It really does mean to carry. In fact, Luke uses this word in Acts 21 to describe how the Roman soldiers physically carried Paul out of the Jerusalem mob. It's unusual in this world, but it ought not be so in our church or in the church in general. We have an obligation to carry those who are weak or infirm in their faith. Why? Well, the verse tells us because they're without strength. Literally, this could be translated, it's, it's impossible for them. They do not have power. And Paul continues, and not just to please ourselves. When he uses this word, he's talking about gaining approval, not just approving of ourselves. We ought to bear the weaknesses of those who are without strength, who have no power, and not just please ourselves, not just seek for our own approval. Now we know from Paul's words in Galatians 1, this isn't about dealing with gaining human approval. This isn't about being a man pleaser. This isn't just for eye service. This is about self-sacrifice. We'll see this in greater detail in just a minute as we move forward through this. But I love the way that Dr. Kent Hughes deals with this when he says, what's the pleasing others that Paul enjoins here? Listen carefully. It is a determined adjustment of our lifestyle to whatever will contribute to the spiritual good of the other person. I'm going to say that again. It's the determined adjustment of our lifestyle to whatever will contribute to the spiritual good of the other person. What, what a statement to hang over our lives. That we would be resolved, determined to adjust for whatever will contribute to the spiritual good of another person. He continues, this is not to be done with a spirit of resignation or an air of condescension. It's to be done with humble love, sympathy, and patience. Of course, then we have to talk about the attitude that we do it in. How difficult is that? Not with a spirit of resignation or an air of condescension. Folks, this is how wicked our hearts are. That we would, even as we go about the work of obedience and saying, well, I'm going to bear with this person in their immaturity, infirmity, and lack of faith, that we jump the tracks into sins by polluting our offering with vanity and self-centeredness. That we would say, look at me as I lay aside myself for this weaker brother. Blowing our trumpet on the street corner so we can have approval from men. Or we do it with a bad attitude. We lay aside our liberty. We lay aside our own process to bear the weaknesses of others with an attitude that says, well, I'd like to be doing this, but because of brother or sister so-and-so, they can't handle it, so and we cultivate a sense of superiority, pride. We foster bitterness. When Paul speaks here of bearing with others, please don't misunderstand that he, he, he means simply putting up with them. One commentator says, we're apt to think of others' weaknesses and infirmities as a burden we must put up with for the Lord's sake as our particular cross for the present. Instead, God's word here teaches us gladly to bear, to take over as our own these infirmities. Bear one another's burdens is the law of Christ, Galatians 6.2. And I'll admit there's a temptation to think as we consider the body, because by the way, I'm just going to pause here and interject the fact that the Christian life is to be done within the body. There's no New Testament pattern for rogue believers who are off doing their own thing apart, trying to cultivate, quote unquote, their ministry. We need the body. And there's a temptation to think, oh, this person, this other brother, this other sister in my circle of fellowship, in the church, they're just holding me back. Imagine if I didn't have that 
hang up. Imagine if they didn't have that problem. There's a temptation to think that. So we consider our neighbors. That's what verse number two is going to mention. Each one of us is to bear, excuse me, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good. How often do we sinfully think that our neighbors are somehow less than us? We develop pride about them, pride about ourselves. And in those moments, we're thinking too highly of ourselves and our supposed godliness. It's the Father who knits the body together with all of its parts. When we have those who are weak in faith, we're to bear with them and instruct them, bringing them to maturity. And this takes definite humility, adjusting the pace for those who are weaker because it's about healthy sheep, not just greener pastures. We consider ourselves the servants of others. This becomes a little bit more understandable. Paul continues and emphasizes this theme in the next verse. Look with me at verse 2. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. What's amazing here is this is a command. There's there's a sense of that in verse 1, but there's an imperative in verse 2. This verse could be rendered, each of us be pleasing his neighbor for his good, for his edification. And look at the intent here. Why should we lay aside our preferences and liberty? Why should we do what chapter 14 was all about? Not abusing your liberty in Christ in the face of other believers who would be injured in the process by sinning against their conscience. Why would we do this? Aren't we supposed to be free in Christ? Yes, but not at the expense of our neighbors. The reason we bear these weaknesses are for their good. If we, in bearing their weaknesses permit them to not grow or permit them to not become strong in their faith, we're not doing them good. And if we, in pleasing our neighbor, do not encourage their edification, we're not really pleasing them. Because edification is the great watchword for the Christian's liberty. I remember a conversation not too many years back with a young believer who thought it was so ridiculous that they ought to sacrifice their liberty for the sake of weaker brethren. Why should they do that? The conversation went, Christ bought that liberty. Those other people, those weaker brethren, they just need to get over it and grow up. Brothers and sisters, that's not liberty. That's not humility. That ought to break our hearts. That a professed believer would would care so little for their brothers and sisters in Christ. What's more is that we have this perfect humility modeled for us. Verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, or as the Old Testament testifies, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Believer, do you want to be Christ-like? Lay something down. You want to grow in Christ-likeness? Exercise humility for the sake of your neighbor. Lay down your rights for the good of your neighbor. Christ suffered reproach, mocking, scoffing for the sake of his bride. What have we done for it? What are we willing to set aside for the sake of his bride? Quoting from what one commentator calls the reproaches Psalm, Paul reveals to us some of the Old Testament revelation of Christ's experience. It's it's previewed in the life of the psalmist as he pens this psalm. But for the sake of his people, Christ had long ago determined to suffer and be reproached for the sake of those who were weak. That's us. I know that because Paul uses this exact same term for the weak in Romans chapter 5 to say, while we were weak, Christ died for us. Beloved, we who are strong by grace through faith in Christ are obligated to humble ourselves and bear the weaknesses of those without strength. Simply put, this means serving. This means sacrificing our rights and privileges for others. We, we heard about that this morning. 
in the first two points of Pastor Philip's message. It may not be that we have any in our congregation, it's possible, who are hung up on eating meat because they grew up in a first century Orthodox family and they're a little uncomfortable with your use of bacon bits. But we have believers who are young in the faith or immature in the faith who desperately need those who are strong to serve them. And it may be in discipleship. It may be in accountability. It may be in patience. It may be in being patient with their hang-ups or laying aside your heady theological jargon and bearing with them. It's an endemic problem with those, particularly in my age bracket, that we're often impatient and unloving towards those who don't know as much theological jargon or read as many Puritans as we do. Here's the warning. If we're arrogant about theology, we don't have the first clue about godliness. Christ-likeness is humble and sacrificial. So we ought to serve humbly. And next, we ought to serve united. Look with me at verse 4. <clears throat> for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Did, did you hear the unifier? It's wonderful. Do you, do you realize what one of the things that links us to the saints of the past what links us to the saints at Rome 2,000 years ago? One of the things that connect us to saints who lived on other continents, who often spoke other languages, who have entirely different cultures. We worship the same God. And that's no small point, but I think it's remarkable that Paul brings out here in verses 4 and 5, we have the same word from God. He tells us that the Old Testament serves as an unmistakable link between the people of God then and the people of God for all time. The psalm that Paul just quoted, Psalm 69, was written with a universality to it that in knowing it, we would, by perseverance and encouragement in it, have hope. In other words, we draw from the scriptures for perseverance and encouragement so that we may have hope. Recognize what he just said. He said, a knowledge of the Old Testament, a knowledge of the scriptures will bring about instruction that produces what we need for perseverance and encouragement so that we can have hope. Verse 5 continues. Now, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement... Wait a minute. I thought we just got that encouragement and perseverance from the scriptures. Well, yes, but where have we gotten the scriptures? From God. We receive every word of scripture from him. We draw instruction from the scriptures, and through them, God supplies for our perseverance and encouragement. One commentator says it's ever good to be going over God's dealings, not only with Christ, but with his Old Testament saints. Notice the scriptures are written for our instruction so that, through that so that through perseverance and encouragement we may have hope. Then the God who gives perseverance and encouragement is in the next verse. God gives us exactly what we need. but I'm afraid so often we're negligent of the gifts that he gives. I'm, I'm afraid that so often we disregard, well, it's, it's the scriptures. It's, of course, I did my Bible reading like we were reminded this morning. So often we, we approach it with just a, well, I've checked that off. I've done that because I know that that's a prerequisite. I know that I need to, and therefore, but do we draw from it what God has intended? What's more, Paul's already told us what form that receiving perseverance and encouragement will take. Back in Romans chapter 5, hold your place and turn back there with me. We draw together all the various threads of Scripture as we read through it. We got to hear this morning, Pastor Philip mentioned that if it wasn't for the sequential teaching through chapter by chapter, the next verse 
of the word of God, we, we maybe wouldn't consider what, what is it exactly that the feeding of the 5,000 is recorded for us. We, we had that even this morning in the Sunday school class looking at the book of Joshua as we considered, did you notice that phrase showed up again? That same phrase that was back in chapter 1, that same phrase that was back in chapter 6, that same phrase that was all the way back in the book of Numbers. And if you're here consistently for the consecutive teaching of the word of God, you begin to see these threads pulled together. Here's another one. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Same word, same idea. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Does that sound familiar? Just like in chapter 15. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Turning back to chapter 15. This perseverance, Paul says, God gives. I think it's significant the way that Paul refers to this because of how he's already written about it in chapter 5, what we just saw. I think we can be confident that Paul had a pretty healthy doctrine of the Trinity. So when he says God here, in verse 5, now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement, I believe he's referring specifically to the whole working of the Trinity and involved in that. God the Father, through his design in sending the Son, providing that peace with God that we just read about in chapter 5, mediates by the Spirit this comfort. He gives this perseverance, this perseverance and encouragement. All of this comes from God. Got a lot of material that I'm going to skip over here to get us to this final point. Paul says here in verse 5, Now may the God who gives us perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have as a unifying factor the scriptures. And so Paul is desiring that we would have the perseverance and encouragement from God through the scripture to be of the same mind. Last week we talked about this exact phrase here, this idea of the same way of thinking. That we would have the same mind with one another according to Christ, Jesus. And here we're beginning to see that design of unity. Remember, we ought to serve with humility. We ought to serve with unity. Verse 6, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures by God unite us in the measure of Christ. And beloved, that's, that's the pattern of the scriptures. Again, hold your place here. Look with me at John chapter 17. Here in the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And look what Christ prays here in verse 21. Well, we'll begin in verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, verse 21, that they all may be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even as you have loved me. And this takes place 
through the truth. Verse 19, for their sakes I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. The scriptures are the unifier of believers. They unite us with Christ as God the Father intended. And the end, that, that end that with one accord, here's the design, here's the end, here's the goal, that we would glorify God. Turn back with me to Romans chapter 15. There in verse 6, so that with one accord you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I I love the idea, the, the word that Paul uses here with this idea of one accord. It's, it's actually two words, again, mashed together. The word homo, which means same, and thumos, which means passion. And he creates a new word here, homo thumadon. It's the idea of with one passion, unanimously. Mostly this word is used in the book of Acts. And first, it's used in Acts to describe the church, that they were all of one mind, and they were meeting together with one accord, as it describes the church in Jerusalem. And throughout the book of Acts, as it talks about believers gathered together, it says that they were of this same description, that they were of one mind, one passion. When it doesn't refer to believers, it refers to mobs intent on a single purpose. It's the word that Luke uses to describe the Sanhedrin rushing at Stephen in Acts 7. Translated, one impulse, they rushed upon him. Or it's used of the worshipers of Diana at Ephesus as they create a riot where they chant, great is Diana of the Ephesians. But it's continually got this idea of a single, single, unified purpose and drive. Paul says, this is what we're going for. That we would, with one accord, verse 6, with one voice, And it takes us right to our final point. This unity is not for our own purpose. We're not unified for, you know, the accomplishment of our dreams or to wipe out world hunger or to make a name for ourselves. Humanity has already tried that. Remember the Tower of Babel? Genesis chapter 11. How those just after the flood said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They wanted unity. But for themselves and their own purposes. That's not what Paul has in mind here. We're not united for the sake of unity. Instead, as our third point would remind us, we ought to serve in humility united for the glory of God. One Bible scholar, Alva McLean, has said, there's no other place where joy and peace and fellowship and unity can be had. No other place exists where people who are diverse in mind, method, characteristic, nature, and makeup can find unity and peace. That place is the mind of Jesus Christ, which is revealed in the Bible. Look at the end of verse 6. So that with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another pastor says, the consummate purpose of Christian unity is to please the Lord. Both inwardly and outwardly, both individually and corporately. It's to please the Lord. It's to glorify God. And I'm afraid sometimes we hear this so frequently that it becomes just rote. It becomes, well, of course, and all to the glory of God. But truthfully, that's why we've been created. We're image bearers, and we have, as redeemed children of God, been saved for his namesake so that he would be exalted. This even has a place in relation to missions. The remainder of the of the chapter in Romans chapter 15, Paul is going to draw the lines that he's laid here around the inclusion of the Gentiles and his own labor to proclaim the gospel where it's not been proclaimed. He's going to continue from here and he's going to talk about, therefore, accept one another, especially as it relates to the Gentiles coming in 
And then he's going to talk about his own mission. Chapter 15, verse 20, where he says he makes it his aspiration, his ambition to preach Christ where he's not been named. In other words, Paul says all of these things are driving towards a unified body of Christ, a unified body of believers who are intent upon the glory of God. It requires humility. It requires unity around the person and word of Christ, around the singular aim of the glory of God. So with this in mind, I want us to consider just a few implications. I want to close out just asking a few questions that I've worded very carefully as we, because my heart's right in here too. These are for the body. Do we believe that the church is primarily for us or for our wants to be met? Do we believe that when we come to a gathering of the church that it's primarily to have our needs, immediate desires satisfied for whatever feeling or emotion we've been dealing with that week to be dealt with? Do we serve for what we can get or because God is worthy? Do we serve because, well, this is just what you're supposed to do? Or do we serve out of a desire that with one voice we would glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Here's some questions we can ask ourselves to know. In what ways am I serving in Christ-like humility? In what way, today, have I set aside my wants and preferences for the good and edification of another? That's getting really concrete. In what ways have I set aside my wants and preferences for the good and edification of another? What's more is the verse that's taken from verse 2. It says our neighbor. Who's a closer neighbor than our spouse? Another question. In what ways have I availed myself of serving someone else to find out where I can set aside my liberty for their benefit. Remember, I mentioned that so often this exercise of humility just means serving, which means that at some point you're going to have to set yourself aside. I'm afraid that we're so often inclined to be self-serving that we treat the church like a restaurant where we come to get served, we leave a tip in the offering plate, and we go about our day. And we act surprised when someone would offer us an apron and invite us to come wait on tables ourselves. When was the last time I was thoughtful to the needs of those weaker in faith? Arrogance keeps us from this and from being aware of the needs of those around us and their infirmity. In what way am I seeking to sacrificially serve to the good and edification of other believers? Can can I list any of them? Can I state, this is how I'm doing it. This is how I'm serving others. This is how I am being Christ-like in my humility in relationship to the church. As I already mentioned this evening, it's, it's so encouraging as I look around community. And this is a staple of who we are, I believe. I believe that, that I can name and list ways in which I see members of our body sacrificially serving consistently. Please don't feel that this is just taking a beating stick all night. I, I, could, I could tell you about the four or five people who were taking their spring break and two teenagers who were doing it too, to go to Guatemala. I could tell you about people who have taken vacation time to serve a bunch of screaming kids in VBS. I can tell you about people who have sacrificed much to serve in the nursery week after week, who are ready to serve at a moment's notice, who have sacrificed their weekend to come and serve at a ladies' or a men's conference, who will say, whatever it takes, I just want to serve. 
I want to commend the community in that, but I also want to challenge it, like Paul does the church at Thessalonica, and yet grow more and more. Next, how are we serving united for the weaker in faith? What ways are we uniting with our fellow believers to glorify God? So often this is summed up around here as simply just showing up. As we're uniting with other believers in worship and preaching. When was the last time we were united in hope and encouragement through the scriptures? Do you ever just share scripture? Not to check in with your accountability partner. Not to let somebody know, yeah, I'm, I'm reading today. But because it's just so good. Do you ever share it with other members of the body for their edification? Do we live consciously with the aim of glorifying God in humble unity? One of the ways that this looks is by asking ourselves, do we sow contention or seek unity in Christ? Do we seek our own advantage? When have we laid down preferences for the sake of unity, humility, in a church culture that's saturated so often with a me-first mentality? The booklet that the ladies received for their conference book, for the women's conference, it lists wonderful ways of doing this. It even asks, where do you park in consideration of others? Do we viciously guard our territory? This is my seat. This is my place. We've sung that song three times this month. Where have we laid down preferences for the sake of unity, humility, in a church culture that's so often saturated with me first? Finally, are we serving in humble, united God glorification? Community, this is a command from our God that we would serve with an attitude of Christ-likeness, sacrificing ourselves, sacrificing for the good and edification of others, united to the goal of God glorification. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this church. It's your church. And Lord, you have composed its parts to accomplish your purposes. Father, may we be a faithful body of believers who are dedicated towards exhibiting Christ-like humility, united on the purpose of glorifying God, of lifting your name high, that it would be above reproach, that it would be seen as worthy, that as this body serves, it would be demonstrating the glory that's due your name. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.